Well, good morning. It's great to be with you again uh, this morning and uh, looking forward to kind of getting into our uh, time and looking at Ephesians. We've been kind of walking through the, the letter and uh, the, uh, starting in chapter four kind of uh, uh, leads into some more of the kind of, I don't say ethical, but kind of more of uh, things that we should do now as the fact that we have a new identity in Christ and how do we live that out. And so, but first of all, I want to say good, good morning. I hope you're all doing well and this glorious. It's wonderful. We got the sunshine out um, this morning. It was raining all day yesterday. So it's great to see the sun again. At least I think that's what that big shiny light is in the sky. But uh, if you're visiting us with um, today, um, we're so glad that you're here. Take a minute, stop by the Welcome Center. We have a, a gift bag for you with some things about our church and some uh, th- some things that are going on in the in the you know uh, in the church, and we'll have uh, um, some activities for that as well. You can also put uh, you have connection cards. I might have said this earlier, but you can put those um, in the pews and fill those out. And also, uh, feel free to put a prayer request in those. It's a great way of um, sharing prayer requests if you feel you know uh, you want to keep it private or whatever. You can uh, put that on there. Um, for, uh, a few assi- uh, announcements I have this morning that I'd like to talk with you about. First of all, um, starting tomorrow, um, we're going to be doing this uh, November um, long kind of uh, ministry uh, of, of kind of collecting some of our food belongings and then bringing them um, to one of the food banks. And so you might have seen this kind of a calendar that um, shows a little bit about what you need to do. And all you need to do is just follow the calendar. You know, so like for tomorrow, um, take a can of beans if you have it out of your cupboard and put it in a box and you know, pray over it. And, um, and the next day, you know, you know, kind of walk through that. If you don't have the items, you don't have to worry about going out and getting them. This is kind of a guide. So this is, you don't, you don't need to be legalistic about it and kind of you have to follow everything. Um, and then what you want to do is at the end, as you get close to Thanksgiving, uh, to uh, take it to one of the uh, food banks that we have in the area. On the back, it'll have all the different places to do that. Um, to feel free. If you feel uncomfortable and driving or you can't drive, but you still want to partake participate in this, please let us know. There's a sign-up sheet by the welcome desk. You can just sign your name and say, I want to do this, but I need somebody to help me to bring those um, canned goods there, and somebody else can sign up to bring them um, to one of the food banks on your behalf. Just a great way for outreach and to, to share on um, the love of Christ with others and, and to um, give people food that really either can't afford it for themselves or really having a difficult time right now. Second, today is the last day to send in your photos or updates for the church directory, so please send them via text, email to church office, you know, no later than today, um, and that'll help you kind of update our, our directory um, if you want to be a part of that. Also, um, on uh, November, Wednesday, November 17th at 6 p.m., we're going to be having a, a church potluck. Okay, and there's a sign-up sheet, um, I think, uh, by the Welcome Center, the sign-up for whatever you'd like to bring for that. Um, I think Greg brought that this morning, and so you can have uh, that, the sign-up. And we're just going to have a time of just, you know, fellowship to kind of interact with each other and, and have a good meal and just talk and fellowship. So it'll be kind of a, a light, you know, um, a casual time of just being able to be with each other. So it's a great time to have some fellowship with the community of believers. Um, also, we're in the process of updating the youth room. It's right above these stairs, right through those doors there, and we've been kind of up, updating the room, and we're kind of been updating on, on getting the carpet in there as well, and so things are, are progressing, and we, I just want to say thank you to all those who have participated and updating the youth room. There's been a lot of work by a lot of different people, people staying you know, later at night or coming in on weekends to help out or whatever. So you know, things are going um, you know, pretty well in there. We've got some other things that need to be worked out, but we're moving you know, f- through there. So I just wanted to say thank you for all your help with that. Um, I encourage you to look at the bulletin. We have several things that are coming up um, in the uh, next couple weeks. Uh, and so kind of looking forward to that as well. Now, we're going to be kind of, you know, walking through our journey um, through the Ephesian letter, and I think this is one of, not only one of my favorites, but I think one of the most important letters ever written, and when I say that, not just in the New Testament, but in antiquity. If you look at the ancient world, letters were given. Cicero was famous for writing letters to people. This is one of the most uh, beautifully written and wonderfully rich letters that we have in all of uh, the first century as well as antiquity. And we've kind of been walking through this letter and kind of looking at the different themes. And I've talked about the, the idea of understanding who we are in Christ. Understanding where our power comes from now that we are Christians, that we have power because the Holy Spirit has indwelt us, that we can now live out this life that he's called us to. And what we're going to be looking at you know, today and really from, from now until the rest of the letter is looking at our responsibility now as Christians. 
Now, with great power comes great responsibility. And last week, we learned about putting off the old things and putting on the new things. And today, we're going to learn about how that lives and how that uh, we actually do that in practice and what that looks like if, in our behavior. So we're kind of looking through that. So today, I want to talk to you about how to love one another in Christ. And sometimes we say, oh, well, this is an easy topic. We just need to love each other. But one of the things sometimes we lose is how do we do this? You know, we can say I love you to somebody, but you know, a lot of times our actions will speak louder than our words. If we're loving and telling someone we love them, but we're not treating them very well, well then we're really not loving them. And so what Paul does is he gives some instructions about how to love someone. How does this work in real life? And so we're going to be looking at Ephesians 4, um, verses 25, and then going into um, chapter 5, the first two verses, um, they're on page um, 1038 in the Pew Bible. If you have you know, your cell phone or an iPad, or if you're at home watching this later, you can use whatever um, you have at home. So one of the things that I think is really amazing about this text is just how beautifully it's written, how well it's argued, and what Paul says here, and listen to what he says starting in verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so blown away by this text that you don't leave us alone, that you send your Holy Spirit to help us, and you give us instruction about how to live this life, a life that you helped us live, and you will continue to help us live. And the fact that you've died on a cross, risen from the dead, gives us hope that we can live this life in the midst of you, with you, and for you. And I just pray, God, that this, um, the message that comes out of my mouth this morning will be pleasing to you, be coming from you. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, help us to apply this um, um, text to our lives, and help it to our very um, uh, bodies, and help us to just live out what you're calling us to, knowing that we, don't, we can do this together as a body in Christ through your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, we kind of walk through some of the things here and, and, and review, and one of the things that's amazing about this is that Paul just keeps building on his argument. He just keeps layering it on top. It's like, this is going to be based on this, and this is based on that, and this is based on this, and he's just coming to this crescendo, which we'll talk about in chapter 6 when we get there on the armor of God. But until then, Paul keeps building on his argument. You've noticed since chapter 4, there's been four therefores. One of his favorite words is therefore. And so one of the things that we're going to be walking through is why is the therefore therefore in a minute. But for, for, uh, one of the things that we need to look at is what have we been talking about because it continues to build on each other. If you've missed the last few sermons, I would really recommend to go back and look at the website. We've got all the sermons there. You can get caught up or if there's things that you're not clear on to go back and, and watch those. Um, our, our walk must be different than the world. That's what we talked about last week. And this is what he's going going to refer back to on our journey this morning through the rest of chapter 4. Therefore, live your life in a manner worthy of your new identity in Christ. That's how he begins this new section in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, as a prisoner in the Lord, I urge you to live worthy of the calling you received. Now that you know who you are in Christ, chapters 1 through 3, you need to live that out in the Lord and knowing that the Spirit will help you through that. 
He also talks about the idea here that thinking is what happens when we process things, but what the thing is going on here in our thinking is that it leads to action. You know, unless some sort of, you know, bear crashes through the, the room and we just have a, you know, fight or flight response, most things that happen in life happen and we act on because we thought about them first. Either consciously or sub- subconsciously or unconsciously, we just, we th- have thought about it. Boy, I would really like to do so and so or act on something or something happened and I'm going to uh, respond. And so our thinking leads to action. And then when we act, it leads to an outcome. And we talk about this. And this kind of pattern is going to continue throughout this letter. So what we have to do is we have to get our minds right and kind of replay those, you know, kind of re-substitute our message answer machine system in our heads. Some of us are playing tapes of the old life that we have before we became a Christ. Whatever it is, your background and who you, how you grew up, your background in your life, what your parents were like, what kind of childhood you had, all those kinds of things will um, affect how you live your life. And what Paul wants to do is say, all those things are part of who you are, and they're important, but we need to do what? We need to replace some of those tapes in our head with the tapes of God's word and his message about who we are. And so that's what he wants us to do because what Christ wants is to have a positive, Christian, impactful outcome, and that starts in our head. And some of us are looking at life through a lens that we grew up with, that we got from our parents or our grandparents or our childhood or some sort of traumatic experience that we had in life, and that has affected how we think in the world. You know, if someone has been grown up in a household or whatever that feels like, you know, you are unworthy or been told that you will never amount to anything or came from a critical household or had some sort of, you know, bondage to your past in terms of alcoholism or drugs or whatever, that is going to affect how you think and how you act in the world. And what Jesus wants us to do, what Paul is saying is to change how you think, to realize who you are in Christ and live out that life now in a new way so that you don't respond based upon how you grew up, but who you are now in Christ. And that is a process, and it takes time, but that is what Paul is calling us to. By the Holy Spirit, lay aside your former way of life and put on the new way of life in Christ. And this is our overall goal. This is why we're still here on this earth, is to be mature and complete in Christ. It's a process. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, that the fact of the matter is that when we become believers in Jesus, we are now infants in Jesus. It doesn't matter how old we are when we come to Christ. If you're 80 years old and you come to Christ, you're still a baby Christian. And you need to grow up in the Lord. And so what Paul wants us to do is to be mature and complete in Christ, to be unified in our understanding of the truth of the Christian life, to serve Christ as our Lord and share his message of good news with others. That really is our goal in life. That is the most important thing that we do. This is what Paul wants And so what he does is then is he situates this whole text in live out who you are in Jesus. And some of us are thinking that we are not this kind of a person. And what Paul is saying right from the beginning of this letter is you are a saint because you are in Jesus. And he now wants us to live that out in our lives. And so if we can get our minds around the fact that we are new people in Jesus, Yes, we have pasts, and some of us have things in our past that we're ashamed of or have had dark experiences in our lives. And what Jesus is saying to us is that all of those things were nailed to the cross, and he got one victory over those things. And so your past trials or failures or the how you grew up is now destroyed in Jesus. And so now you have to figure out a way to live a new life in him and he's going to help you in that process. The Spirit's going to help you. And that is the beauty about the Christian life is it's not about picking yourselves up and trying harder. It's about allowing the Spirit to live his life through you. 
So what Paul does here in the beginning of chapter um, 4, looking at verse 25, is he begins this with another therefore. And the funny joke is I've been telling this probably ad nauseum is what is the therefore therefore? It's an extremely important question. Sometimes we just skip over it like it doesn't matter, but what Paul is doing is he's referring back to what he's already talked about. What Paul is saying here is that now that you are a new creation in Christ, put on your new self. If you want to understand what your new self is all about, look through the first three chapters of Ephesians, and every time you see the phrase, in Christ or in him, write it down. There's over 35 references of in Christ in this letter, and they all talk about who you are now in Jesus, that you're redeemed, that you're loved, that you're chosen, that you're adopted, and it goes on and on and on. Put on your new self, which includes getting rid of the old self. So you lay down your old things that you are battling, those bondages you had in the past, and you put on Jesus. And this is the helpful thing, is you exchange one way of living for another way. Paul wants to further explain to the Ephesian church what it means to live out our new life in Christ. Here's the kicker. Changed behavior should flow out of one's new identity in Christ. This is what it's all about, living out who you are in Jesus. So what does Paul do here is he gives us from application about what this should look like and guides for us to look at what we can do in order and what this should look like, kind of a reference point. And so in the beginning of chapter 15, he says, therefore, put away all lying. Put away falsehood. He's saying here, Christians should be people who don't lie, who are not in a habit of lying, Yes, we'll probably make mistakes in life from time to time, but this should not be who we are. Somebody should not look at a Christian and say, boy, that person is a liar. They're constantly speaking falsehood. Lay it aside. Get rid of it. Bury it in the ground and don't dig it back up again. Lay it aside. Put it away. So one commentator summed it up. Honesty is essential for mutual trust and is foundational to life in the community of the believers. What is lying all about? Lying is lying or telling something to somebody a falsehood, and it's basically you're breaking trust with that person. And the thing is that no one is going to trust a person who lies all the time. You're just not. If you're constantly hearing lies from somebody, then you're never going to understand or uh, trust them at all. I mean, I've been, one of my favorite shows is Law and Order and watching that show. And one of the things is that the lawyers will do is they'll get a witness and they, and they want that witness to make sure that they're telling the truth. And if they're not going to tell the truth, then they don't bring them up as a witness because they don't want them lying on the stand. And this is what Jesus and Paul are saying here is that what we should do as Christians is be people who tell the truth, even if it's uncomfortable even if it causes problems in our life, the truth is more important because no one is going to trust a person who lies all the time and it's not gonna affect our witness. We'll have more of an impact if we're people who tell the truth. Then he also says not only to put away lying but to speak the truth. So there's an idea here of getting rid of something and adding something on. So put away lying but put on speaking the truth. Paul wants us to do this, to be honest, to show integrity. Paul here quotes from uh, um, Zechariah 8, 16. He says, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment. Zechariah 8 is all about the Lord's promise to dwell with his people, that he's not gonna leave them in bondage, and if, and if the Lord doesn't um, follow along on his promise, then he's not telling the truth. And the Lord has never, ever lied. We can follow him and we can trust that what he's saying will happen. It may not happen as fast as we hope it does, but we can trust that what he says will come true. 
He will not leave his people in bondage. He will restore them. What Paul is saying here is this. Christ followers, you are God's newly created people. It is time for us to live out who we are in Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is to tell the truth. Tell the truth of his gospel. Tell the truth of his word. Be honest when someone asks you questions about not only about who you are, but about the faith. We don't have to be afraid to talk about things that we're struggling with or dealing with because if we get it out on the open, we can deal with the issue. And see, what Paul wants us to do is to understand that we're the body of Christ and to be having to be able to be with each other and to be able to speak truth to each other is really, really powerful. And unfortunately, sometimes in our, in our churches around this world, we, we come to church and we feel like we've got to have everything together. That everything's got to be okay in our lives. Have you ever anybody come up to you and, 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 and said, you know, how are you doing today? And you're really not feeling well, or you're really going through a bad time, or you really just are sad or depressed, or you feel anxious about something, and how do you respond? I think we've all done this, including me. I'm doing fine. I'm doing well. I'm doing good. Everything's fantastic. And this is how we live in the world. We go to our boss, you know, or whatever, our coworkers, and they say, you know, around the, you know, the, 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 the water tower, how is it going? Oh, I'm doing fine. Things are great. How are the kids? Fantastic. Meanwhile, we've got all these problems in our, in our lives, and we're not going to share those with people at work, but if there's one place we should be able to share them, it's the body of Christ. Right? We're not a place of gossip. We're a place of telling the truth of people coming together to get help, to get re- refreshed, to pick up people when we're down, to bear the burdens of each other. That is what Paul is talking about here. Put away lying, speak the truth, be a person of integrity, be honest. Number two, uh, verse 26, he says, be angry and do not sin. And you might read this and think, what does he mean by this? Does this mean we have the right to be upset all the time and angry? Well, what he's saying here is that all anger is not sinful. So there's times when it's okay to be angry, and you might be righteous in your anger. Think about times of, of Jesus turning over the, t- the, the tables in the temple. He wasn't doing that with a smile on his face and a pleasant tone like, oh, sorry about the, 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 you know, the table. I'm just going to turn this over if that's okay. No, he was upset. He was turning them over with you know, anger and, and, and righteousness, or think about um, a husband or a wife being angry over someone trying to hurt their spouse. Or parents wanting to protect their children. I'm sure a lot of us, you know, that, that have children have had that situation where some, we're driving down the road with our kids in the back seat and some car kind of swerves over and almost hits us. And what do we do? We get upset. We get mad. We, you know, say something that sometimes we regret saying out loud. One of the, my, my dad never used to like to swear, but one of the things he would swear is if somebody cut him off on the highway while the kids were in the back of the car. I got the kids in the back of the car. You know, like one of those kind of things. It's this righteous anger. You're upset. Someone almost hurt your loved one. Now, how we respond in that, yes, we don't, we, we can be angry, but we don't want to sin as well. So Paul warns us that if, if our anger progresses and becomes inappropriate, that's when it leads to sin. That's when it can lead down a dangerous road. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, are you an angry person? Does every little thing set you off? Because if you're always reaching the boiling point, like, you know, whatever the temperature, I forget what the temperature of boiling water is, but if you're like one degree below boiling water all the time, and the most simple thing sets you off to the boiling pot and your top goes off, you can't just say, well, that's who I am. Because what the scriptures are saying here is that we cannot do that. And so if we are an angry person, then what the, the scriptures are saying is that that's something that the Lord needs to work with you in life. He doesn't want Christians to be known as angry, bitter people who are running around this world angry at every little thing and every single thing sets them off. 
Anger should not be a way of life for a believer. And he says this, and don't let the sun go down on your anger. Anger should not be an ongoing occurrence. When evil happens or someone puts our lives in danger or members of our family in harm, yes, we should be angry. If there's injustice in the world, we should be angry at it. But never let your anger boil over. And the Torah sunset was the time limit for paying a worker his wages. Deuteronomy 24, 15 says, you are to pay him his wages each day before the sun sets because he is poor and depends on them. Otherwise, he will cry out to the Lord against you and you will be held guilty. So Paul apparently here is picking up on this saying and saying that it's sunset is the time limit for nursing your anger. So if you're upset, you better get your anger over with before sunset. 24 hours. It should not linger for days on end because it's just going to boil over and at some point we're gonna be like a pressure cooker and we're gonna let off steam and sometimes we wind up doing it to the people we love the most because we're never gonna do it at work because we don't wanna get fired. We're never gonna do it to a cop who pulls us over. We're gonna do it to a loved one because they're called to what? To love us. But that causes harm in the family if you're always blowing your top to family members. Look at verse 27. And don't give the devil an opportunity. This is what's going on here is Paul says, get rid of anger quickly because the longer you let it boil over, the sooner and the more opportunity the devil has to take an opportunity to not only to cause your anger to get worse, but to become a bondage in your life a place where you're always angry. Don't let the devil get an opportunity. Squash it immediately. Why is Paul so adamant about getting rid of anger? Because he knows that the longer we let our anger take hold of us, the more susceptible we are to allowing Satan to get a foothold. And the more he gets a foothold in your life, whether it's anger or anything else, the faster he has a a way to create put a, you in bondage, in chains, to where you are almost incapable of not being angry. It becomes who you are, and that's not what Paul wants. This is why it's so foolish and unwise to let one's anger fester. The next one he says here is of something that I think we probably don't need to explain more than this, but the thief no longer steals So we should not be people who are stealing. And then he says this in the second part is, instead he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with one another in need. One of the reasons why we're doing this ministry in November is that those of us who are in need can share the love of Christ and give to people who actually need something in life. And sometimes one of the biggest necessities in life is food. And there are people who go hungry in this world every single day. It's people in our communities that go hungry every single day. So do not steal, but work hard. Work hard benefits others. It's not just your own working hard for your own prestige or building your resume, but for a Christian, it's about helping other people. You work hard so that you can, you're getting provided so that you can provide this bounty to others. Helping others and loving our neighbor is what is expected of Christians. In Acts 20, Paul ends his farewell address to the elders of the Ephesian church. Back in the mid-50s, he was there for about three years ministering to the church of Ephesus. And he has his following exhortation to the elders. And he says this, in every way I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of Lord Jesus because he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So why do we work so hard in life? So that we can give to other people and not just accumulate possessions or wealth for ourselves, but to give it to life. This is so contradictory in our world because in our world, it's all about getting more, getting more money, getting more things, accumulating product, putting them in a storage center so you have this wealth that are be created and so you can stand on a pedal and say, look at me and my accomplishments. For the Christian, it's about how, if I've been blessed with something, how can I give it to someone 
else. That is what we've been called to. Second one he talks about here is be careful about what comes out of our mouths. We talked uh, uh, several months ago, we looked through the book of James, and one of the things he talks about there is watch your tongue. He says, but no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone to need so that it gives grace to those who hear. So use, Paul wants us to use our world's, uh, words to build up people, not tear them down. And you can destroy somebody by what you say. That old line we might have heard from kids is really not the truth. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. I don't know about you, but I'd rather get in a fight and have uh, you know, bruises all over my face and have my face be able to heal because some of the things that people have said to me over the years still might have had, what, effect on my life. If someone's told you that you don't belong here or that you're no good or that you uh, can't amount to anything, those kinds of things stick with you for a lifetime. And Jesus wants to help you get through that problem. So words can really damage someone, and we have to be careful that we as Christians are not destroying people by why, what we say to them, even if we disagree with them, even if they are doing things that we don't like, we have to watch what comes out of our mouths. Use words to build people up. There's so much discouragement in our world, and we as Christians need to be people who are encouraging people in Christ. You mean a lot to me. You're worthy because of who you are in Christ. I love you as a brother and sister in Christ. You can do this because I know God has a plan for your life. Encouraging people, building them up, bearing the, the love with them. The word fool here means more than just using swear words, foul. The word in Greek literally means putrid. So you could translate this as let no putrid language come from your mouth. The word was used here to refer to rotten wood or diseased lungs or rancid fish or withered flowers or rotten fruit. So we don't want to speak rotten fruit on someone's life, right? Because rotten fruit, if you let it sit around for a while, it starts to really stink, right? And so that's kind of the things that we need to really focus on here is of how we can uh, praise someone in terms of uh, living up to this you know, life that he's giving us and speak words to them that will build them up. Words have power, and we talked about power a lot, have the power to hurt someone or to help someone. How are we using our words? Verse 30, he says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. So we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit if we have to trust in the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that should motivate us how to live in ways that are consistent by um, the, the calling that God has given us in our life. And so the Spirit is especially grieved. And yes, he gets upset. He's grieved. If you're a parent and your kids say something that you really don't like, you're grieved by what they're doing. It bothers you. It grieves you. You feel, have you ever someone said, well, I'm really disappointed in what you're saying? The spirit is grieved when followers of Christ speak unkindly to one another. It really bothers him. Second half of this verse recalls what Paul says way back in Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. In him, you were also sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the day of redemption, of the possession to the praise of his glory. The day of redemption here refers to the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. New Testament scholar Clinton Arnold, I think, sums this up well, and I think this is really powerful. He says, the new identity in Christ involves a seal of ownership and belonging that cannot be broken until Christ comes and claims his people as his very own. The spirit now is indwelt in you, has sealed you, and the last thing that the spirit wants is for you to uh, say things to others that hurt them. It grieves them, him. The Holy Spirit wants you to live a life that is pleasing and is worthy for the calling that you've received in your life. Yes, we're not going to be perfect, but this is something that we should be striving after in your life. In verse 31, he says here, let all bitterness 
anger, wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you along with all malice. This is a very, very powerful passage. We don't like hearing these words. Well, wait a second, Pastor. You don't know what that person said to me, or you don't know what that person posted on Facebook, or you don't know what that person did when they cut me off on the highway. Don't I have a right to be such and such? What does Paul say here? Remove all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, malice, and slander. How you talk to people, and this is the real gist of the issue, how you talk to people reveals the spiritual condition of your heart. How do you produce good fruit if the root is connected to Jesus? So if we're constantly people who are bitter or angry or slandering or shouting at each other, and by shouting I mean, have you ever been in those arguments where it's kind of like a screaming match towards each other? You've seen this, I mean, just look on your YouTube or Facebook, and you see, I was looking at this the other day, you had like Patriot fans or whatever getting into a fist fight in the middle of a football game. Screaming and yelling. I mean, one of the biggest uh, fights I ever saw was at a Boston Red Sox Yankees game in Fenway Park in the bleacher section. They should have a warning label there that says, you know, if you don't want to get in a fight, don't sit here. But we should not be those kinds of people who are letting our emotions get the best of us. Remove all anger, wrath, shouting, slander, remove all that, and do what, verse 32? He just doesn't say don't do it. He says don't do this and add this on. So don't do these things, but in verse 32, and be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. There's a great example here about forgiveness of this and what Christ did for us on the cross and rising from the dead. That is how and why we are able to forgive others because he has forgiven us as well. And the person that you might be really upset about and the person that actually really caused you harm and said things that really hurt you, Jesus died for that person too. And sometimes we don't want Jesus to die for that person. We want them to die for what they did to us. And the fact of the matter is that we don't deserve to be saved either. But Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross and rose from the dead so that we could have new life. Even us, people who sin and may at times say things we regret. And this is what he wants us to do, to be kind and compassionate to one another. It takes actually more energy in your body to be angry than it does to be nice. It's better for your holistic system, your body, your health. People who are kind and compassionate, who love each other, are more relaxed. They don't have tension. They're not living their life like, like this all the time and angry, they're relaxed in life because they're able to love each other the way they're supposed to be loved. Verse, um, chapter five, verse one, he says, another therefore be an imitator of God by walking in love. You say, how can I imitate God? Well, you can't do it in every facet, but you can do it this way. If God is a God of love, then he wants Christians to be people who are loving other People, we talked, sang this morning, you'll know that you're there Christians by your love. Love is the most important thing. Forgive one another. Imitate God by loving. Love is the foundation to walking our, in our new life in Christ. Love is the epitome of what it means to be a Christian. The degree to which you love others shows the degree to which you love God. You cannot love God and hate other people. That is the most important thing. Love, love conquers all. Andrew Lincoln has this wonderful um, quote here. I think that it sums this up well. Believers have been adopted in God's family and should inhibit, exhibit the family resemblance. Somebody said, boy, you look like so-and-so. Boy, you look like your mom or your father or, your, or, or you have uh, spouses that are, have been married for a while start to look like each other. 
And this is what he wants us to do here, is to say that you are part of God's family, and so you should have the family resemblance by how you act in the world, by love, by showing compassion. Be an imitator of God as dearly loved children. God loves you. He died for you. And so he wants you to live that life out in your world. There's no greater love than what Christ did for us on the cross. It says this in John 15, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. We may never have to lay down our lives for somebody else, but we can do it through our words and how we, how we speak to other people, how we love each other. And this is an important thing. If we cannot love other Christians, how will we ever begin to love those who do not know Christ? If we cannot love other believers, how will we ever begin to love those who act differently the way we are, who look differently than we are, have different creeds than we do, who believe different things, who act in a different way? How will we love them if we can't love each other? That is what Paul wants from us. This is the heart of what it means to put on the new life in Jesus. Some practical things that we can look at. Take the sheet, fill it out if you haven't already. Take it with you over the next week and think about um, how am I living my life in the world? What areas of my life do I find the hardest to live out? Maybe you have an anger problem, or maybe there's problems that you have in your thinking, or what you say, or, or whatever it is. Are there things that you can do this week that help you through this, to be a person who's more compassionate, who's more kind, who uh, speaks the truth? Maybe you have a lying problem. We all have sin in our life that we have to deal with. And Paul says here that we, if we pick up the spirit that dwells us and use the power that we have, we can live a life that is pleasing to our Lord. So what areas of life do you find the hardest to do and change? What spiritual disciplines can you do in your life to acquire, to have in your life that can replace the things that you're doing that you really feel ashamed of? It's a process. This is not going to happen overnight. You can't take somebody who has been angry for 50 years and in a, a one little sermon change their hearts so now all of a sudden they're not angry anymore. It's something you need to work through and deal with. I have things in my own life that I've had to deal with for years and thinking about how I can work through those and God has helped me work through those issues. We all have them. Do your actions mark you as a follower of Christ? Because if you're constantly lying to people, then can you really say deep in your heart that you're a follower of Christ? Or if you're screaming anger at someone or, or slandering them or lying or showing wrath or you're blowing your top constantly, are these things of the mark of a believer? Yes, we're all gonna have moments where we make a mistake. We're not, Paul's not talking about the occasional mistake being made. He's talking about a way of life, a consistent way of life. If our actions are the products of our thoughts, what actions say about the state of your mind? Because how you act in the world starts in your head. To renew our minds so that we can have the mind of Christ, so that when we do act in the world, we're acting like faithful Christians who love the Lord. What do we need to do to bring our thoughts in alignment with the commands of Christ? We looked at this question last week. So take these questions, look uh, in your own life and think about what can I do through the power of the Spirit? Maybe I need to talk to another believer, but ask some yourself in prayer this week, God, I wanna change this aspect about my life, whatever it is, and I want you to help me to put on the things that you have asked me to put on so that I can live a life that is pleasing to you each day, moment by moment, getting closer to you, being more conformed to your image, in time. Let us pray. 
Father, we are just uh, blown away by what you've done for us, that you've died on the cross, that you've risen from the dead, that you've given us a new life, a new identity in you, that we're changed, and we're, we're new people, we're a new creation, we're chosen, we're loved, we're redeemed, we're sealed. There's so many things that, we've, that we are now in Christ, and I pray, God, that we'll let those things of who we really are in Christ just wash over our bodies, our minds, our heads, and help us to live our life in light of that, knowing that we can do it through your power. And we can do it as we bear which, with one another in our lives, that we can ask people for help, that we can speak the truth um, to each other and build each other up by what we say. We thank you for your many blessings. I pray, God, that this message that was uh, spoken this morning, that, was, uh, that we have from your word, God, was pleasing to you and it will help us to live a life in a new way through you. In your name we pray, amen. Now is the time for our offering with the ushers. Please come forward. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and all that you provide, Lord. We just pray that you bless this offering, Lord, that 